Published in 1959 by the Harvard Business Review, Sidney Levy's Symbols for Sale would change the way we think about consumer behaviour. The publication of Symbols for Sale marked an important turning point in the field of marketing research. Rather than seeing the consumer as functionally orientated, where purchases are underpinned by microeconomic theory, Levy explained how consumers buy for symbolic reasons. This insight can now be considered a watershed moment among consumer scholars as Symbols for Sale is one of the most cited papers in the field of marketing research. It's for this reason that we will summarise the main points from Symbols for Sale. So let's begin. You're familiar. You're familiar. In his opening paragraph, Levy argues that the consumer is not as functionally orientated as he used to be, if he ever really was. In other words, rather than relying on traditional values such as price and durability, which dominated early marketing theory to explain consumer phenomena, Levy drew attention to the emergence of a more lavishly orientated consumer. One that was motivated by more abstract psychological human responses, such as public opinions and consumer reactions. This new type of consumer, which Levy named uneconomic man, bought things not only for what they can do, but also for what they mean. The distinction between functional value, what the product does, and symbolic value, what the product means, plays a critical role in the maintenance of one's identity in contemporary consumer culture. This is because all commercial objects have a symbolic character for Levy, and making a purchase involves an implicit or explicit assessment of the symbolism. A symbol is appropriate and the product will be used and enjoyed when it joins with, meshes with, adds to, or reinforces the way the consumer thinks about himself. In the broadest sense, each person aims to enhance his sense of self and behaves in ways that are consistent with his image of the person he is or wants to be. Choices are made more easily, either more routinely or more impulsively, seemingly because one object is symbolically more harmonious with our goals, feelings and self-definitions than another. Put simply, we choose to accept or reject certain products or services because they say something about us. Furthermore, the products we consume or don't consume can help to distinguish ourselves from other consumers across several dimensions. For Levy, these dimensions of distinction include gender, age, and social class. Just as most people usually recognize whether something is addressed to them as a man or as a woman, so are they sensitive to symbols of age. Using an advertisement for a soft drink, Levy explains how teenagers may reject the ad and by extension the product because the setting in which the product is consumed, in this case, the family picnic, is incongruent with the images that we associate with being a teenager. For example, Levy explains that teenagers are sensitive to communications which imply childlessness because during these formative years, teenagers try to assert their independence from their family. So while they might enjoy such a picnic, an advert that uses a family picnic as the setting for the consumption of the product may actually symbolize restraint and an inability to be independent from the family, thus leading to a rejection of the advert and the product by the teenage market. In a similar fashion, Levy explains how most goods say something about the social world of the people who consume them. The things they buy are chosen partly to attest to the social positions. In other words, we buy or avoid things that demarcate our position in society. What is more, Levy adds that some comparatively well-defined modes of living and taste patterns 
tend to combine individual symbols into large clusters of symbols. When he explains that the Ivy League cluster of symbols affects the kinds of suits, ties, and to a lesser degree, the cars and liquors certain people buy. Not only do cluster of objects signify affinity towards institutions, brands, or people, but there are also some objects we buy that symbolize such personal qualities as self-control and self-indulgence. However, Levy warns that such tattletale patterns do not always communicate the things we would expect. Before drawing the paper to a close, Levy identifies the symbolic obsolence or the time dimension of symbols. Among all the symbols around us, bidding for our buying attention and energy, there are underlying trends that affect and are affected by the spirit of the times. Every so often there comes along a new symbol, one that makes a leap from the past into the present. And that has power because it captures the spirit of the present and makes other ongoing symbols old fashioned. It's with this in mind, he encourages marketers and consumer scholars to redirect attention to the ways in which products turn people's thoughts and feelings towards symbolic implications, whether this is intended by the manufacturer or not. Because if the manufacturer understands that he is selling symbols as well as goods, he can one, view his product more completely, and two, understand not only how the object he sells satisfies certain practical needs, but also how it fits meaningfully in today's culture so both his business and the consumer can profit. So what does this all mean to you as a student? If you're submitting an assessment on consumer identity projects, Levy's article will be a good starting point to open the conversation. Alternatively, you will increase the credibility of any discussion on functional and symbolic benefits by citing this influential article. To be notified of the next article summary, subscribe to the channel and remember to let first class shortcuts help you to understand first class research. Thank you.